Hello and welcome to the 26th annual Get Lit Festival. I'm Kate Peterson, Director of Get Lit Programs, a nonprofit organization housed within Eastern Washington University. Our program is responsible for Get Lit, Washington State's longest running annual literary festival, which hosts readings, writing workshops, craft classes, panel discussions, and more, featuring many talented writers from our region and beyond. The festival is taking place this Thursday through Sunday, April 11th through the 14th, in many venues across downtown Spokane and Cheney. And we're very excited to be back here with you in this virtual space as well. You can find a full schedule of in-person and virtual events, along with information about all of our festival authors, by visiting our website, getlitfestival.org. Now I'd like to introduce GetLit's Assistant Coordinator, Liz Graves, who will tell us about today's event. Hello, everyone. Today we are going to be hearing readings from Mary Leuna Christensen and Catherine Gaffney, followed by a conversation between the two poets. We'll go ahead and get right to the readings. Our first reader is Catherine Gaffney. Catherine completed her MFA at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and is currently working on her PhD at the University of Southern Mississippi. Her work has previously appeared in Jubilat, Harper Pallet, Mississippi Review, Meridian, Best New Poets, and elsewhere. She has attended the Tin House Summer Writing Workshop, the SAFTA Residency, and the Siwanee Writers Conference as a scholar. Her first chapbook, Once Read as Ruin, was published by Finishing Line Press in 2021. And her first full-length collection, Fool in a Blue House, which won the Tampa Prize for Poetry, was published by the University of Tampa Press in 2023. She lives and teaches in Champaign, Illinois. Please welcome Catherine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Liz, for organizing this event. And thank you to the Get Lit Literary Festival for having me and Mary and to Eastern Washington for University for making uh, the festival possible. Um, so I'll go ahead and read some poems from my collection, which excuse the post-it notes. It's been through a few readings and hence the, the uh, yeah, hence the yellow post-it notes. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to start with the titular poem to the collection, which is titled Like a Salmon or a Fool in a Blue House. I feel like a fool in a blue house, thought I could curate the life we'd live, repot herbs in spring, summer dinners on the deck, year-round sex on the couch. Saturday, we'd bake bread. Sunday, we'd walk in the sleepy evening, steadying ourselves for the week. But we've got none of that, except for sex on the couch. He's bought in, even with the front door open, weather permitting, where extra quiet becomes a game we play. He says his grandmother in old age was like a salmon, wanting to return to Czechoslovakia, fuck then die, fuck then die is a thought I've had in our bed. How a woman in a too large Oxford shirt communicates sex for me translates to never getting off my my size shirt. Please excuse the post-it notes. It's just the dishes are dry and could stand to be rehomed, or the mail has piled up again on the counter and I can't find the surface. Perhaps it would be easier to write in a chorus. I've gone about this all wrong. This is not chess or a set of stringy marionettes where if I leave the pieces for a day, I can return to them unmoved. And I promise the post-it note excusal at the start of the poem was not a nod to the poem itself. I did not make that connection in introducing the poem. <clears throat> uh, so the next poem I'll read is called A Conversation in Home Depot's Kitchen Department with a line from Mrs. Dalloway. The blush started with a gesture after poignant questions about bamboo versus quartz. What brought you to town? The Home Depot kitchen salesman's eyes widened at three letters, PhD. He caught my love's eyes and drew an arch, a rainbow over his belly, over and over, as if to say, you know what to do. Forget the countertops. Go home. Take her in your bed. Yes, I said, your bed and do what men do. I needed to shield my own. Sought the nearest turtle shell I could borrow to conceal my womb. The salesman had somehow conjured in the store before I could tell him that he wore his narcissism like salt, that I prefer men to cauliflower, but that he is inviting me to critically examine this preference. Oh, how my love stumbled over how to exit the conversation as he had once stumbled over the words crochet and croquet in our early flirtations. I find solace in a memory, 
watching the Andy Griffith show, how my love knew the plot. Andy's love interest was a better shot than him, and she waited to show him publicly at a skeet shooting competition. Just wait for her to emasculate him. I thought perhaps he waited for me to emasculate the salesman, tell him about the birth control packet in my purse as a talisman against the very bodily state the salesman suggested, the packet he might mistake for Mike and Ike's. Perhaps my love wanted me to say that he was the one waiting for me to be ready, that he asked to be the housewife to let the bacon and bread walk through the door in my never manicured fingers, a notion of consistency for the trope the salesman drew in the middle of the model kitchens devoid of domesticity, no flour left behind after the sponge's bright wipe, no coffee grounds settled by the machine like grains of soil after shoveling a fresh grave. But I laughed which I felt bounce off the cabinets, lacking my mother's pink depression glass or the thrift store platters patterned with roses and ribbon and smack me. I laughed light, polite. I wish he'd slap me, my love, or fucked me in the model kitchen, asking the salesman pointedly, am I doing it right? All right, a little bit of a, a shorter uh, poem. This one's called The Call. Sundays, I hear church bells through my kitchen window. Tuesdays, it's sirens. Take a tuning fork to my porcelain sink, re-sing the note for you. Most nights, I hear my name, call to tell you, to ask. But you say it must have been the wind. Each time I call, I drop a whole herring down my throat. Harbor salt in my jaw's hinges, working to equate you with salt, or better yet, Summer Lightning. Um, just to kind of frame some of the poems, um, I guess, and maybe transition to the next suite of poems I'll read. Um, a lot of these poems are concerned with domestic spaces, as well as kind of the intimate relationships that often occupy those domestic spaces um, and the tenuousness that comes with like cohabitation. Um, but another suite of the poems in the collection um, well, I guess it's also intimate relationships, but not just partner intimacy, but also familial intimacy. Um, so this next poem kind of works with that familial intimacy. Storm sleep. Mama wouldn't let us fall asleep in storms. Fear of water's rise, of us sleeping to death meant she didn't sleep so we could. Some nights, storms had nothing to do with the weather. Mama didn't sleep in those either. We knew the next morning eyes grayer than her gray blue, cloudy from traveling the house all night. Um, and this poem perhaps moves away from the domestic as much or domestic spaces, um, but definitely deals with sort of inheritances of um, gender expectations or milestones, um, as well as uh, kind of family networks and, and the tensions that come with that. Playing patience. One, we didn't have it, sucking air to balloon our bellies before the mirror, did so to see what we'd look like pregnant, before ever panicking in red panties, but now patient is all we want to be, for the patience required in nine months of nights of no sleep, produces a panic that turns the red pooled in our first period sleeps to joy. Two, we are not made with patience as we kick our mother's distended bellies, asking when we can get out, as we kick the air from our chairs when we can't yet feel the time it takes our mothers to stand over the stove to cook the rice she forgot goes with dinner. Three, scolded patience, 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 only the repetition begins to sink the sounds into our bones. Four, I watched my mother exercise patience as my father cleaned the dusty fan blades an hour before the dinner party. Five, patience takes the wet out of your mouth. The weight leaves you thirsty. Speaking of visitors, I have my cat coming to visit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Six, I learned the patience of waters tested on a horse who threw me time and again. Patience in kicking out her back legs to unseat me. Patient I was in learning to listen for her body's whisper. It's happening again. Seven. Life beats us with patience afterward, with longing for the before of what we've been patient for. Eight. 
The body is a vessel consumed by patience at first and fast forward as it hurdles towards sex and then with working to hamper the growth of crow's feet or veins spidering up calves. Nine. The more we pronounce patience's plosive P, the more we feel its quiet mischief. 10. Patience might divide a human and a dog, but who is better for it? 11. The root of patience is suffering. 12. Two years, my mother hid her 2 a.m. walks along the beach, searching for my stoned brother, walking alone night after night. 13. Every night I get caught in the tide of my patients, try to measure her health, take her temperature, brush her hair, but let her climb a tree to find flight and fall if she needs. Feels kind of perfect that my cat joined given the animals in that particular poem and the lack of patience he just exercised in bursting into the room. Um, but animals are truly like a, a pretty strong current um, throughout the collection. So felt like a, a, an apt interruption. Um, fishwife. It's mostly a life of waiting and counting. Each night I unhook the stars, restrike them the next all floated matches, red before ignition, scales the only glitter tumbling onto my lap. To hear beauty, I fashion earrings from his tired hooks and bait, brightest in my shiplap shack. He's well salted from years of ocean spit and slap, but it all falls away when honeyed tea hits his belly, when he calls me kitten, slips his hand to the soft of my thigh. It's a ritual of bringing him back to land. I've taught myself all the right knots that lasso his waist back to his chair, our bed, my table. I am a denounced planet he burns for. It sounds bad, but it's balance. Not so key that the winds listen for my footfall, but not so forgotten that they sweep me up and out like the nests of fur I brush out the door. I think I have like, yeah, two more poems um, left for you all, one of which um, comes toward the end of the collection, and the other is actually from my newer project, which kind of related to my um, event from last year's Get Lit um, in the vein of docu-poetics, um, Widow's Walk. <clears throat> I walk my widow's walk, not to look out on the sea and expect him to climb from the surf, ragged and torn, all effort to return to me but so I can announce my spidery existence as I web my way through my paces as to how to proceed. Each evening I climb with a light into my neighbors I must look like hope, a small woman made lighthouse directing one phantom ship. But the light is for me to watch my hands age each night, for the veins that spider their way up from my palm's depths, to watch how night floats through sleep that escapes me, to watch how empty this house is without him. But empty is a treacherous word, often a placeholder for grief, for the missing subtraction. But what if I see this word as addition? For the space I've gained in the wardrobe, for the far fewer dishes left in the sink, for the bed I can starfish my way through sleep when I find it and not feel guilty for finding him on the floor. And what if he sees his subtraction as gain? for he has left behind the pressures of closing the house's shutters for storms, of holding my hand when we walk into town. What if he lies on another beach somewhere? What if he knows that all he owns is his body and that the sand is not his, but has no desire to make it so, and the palm trees are not his, and yet they drop coconuts for him? This is not far from how the rain falls for me. And I open my mouth knowing no one will turn the corner and interrupt my joy. All right, let me just take a sip of water. And I'll close out my reading so that Mary can have her wonderful time to read. I'm excited to hear her poems. Um, so just for a, bit, a little bit of context for this last poem, um, my grandparents um, lived in the Netherlands during the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands. Um, and this project is sort of trying to work through how that experience lives in my body um, and sort of ways that it um, impacts my perception um, of current events, particularly in the case of this poem or more so. So this next poem is called Blitz or Mothers at War. <clears throat> On the radio, a journalist for NPR tells of how she huddled with women in a building in Baghdad they couldn't be certain would stand through shellfire. 
When asked for my religion, I told them I believe in God. When asked to sing, she sang a hymn, a nod toward her belief. As a deafening quiet pooled, the women asked the journalist if she was a mother. She is. One of the women grabbed the journalist's breast and laughed at the idea that a breast no larger than a clementine could feed a child. My grandmother entered a conversation not far from this in the living room of her Rotterdam home. That is to say, I am watching my grandmother's testimony about the war. A digital square, a capsule of her I tuck under my bed and take out at night when I need to hear her voice. What a shame the voice says what it says. I have watched this video more times than I should, watched her in her cream sweater and pressed silk blouse speak of her trauma as if recounting a book she'd read lately. Remember the conversation mentioned before. Picture a family sleeping in her home whom she did not know before the war but came to know intimately during. Coffee, maybe, a chocolate early on. They took quiet dark nights after the children fell asleep. Two couples murmured things like wrath, psalm, creed, and birth, but back to the radio. Not the radio my grandmother hid, a child never revealed for fear of the world cannibalizing her. Back to the hand communicated through the ear as it reaches out again and again unendingly to grab the journalist's breast. I set this action in the living room over coffee thin, largely water, now mother to mother, talking of wartime births not virginal. The dry well my grandmother's chest puckered to after months of meager rations and foraging beyond the suburbs. My grandmother stumbled over the word breast. Think how this maternal nocturne might crescendo if the room's other mother grabs my grandmother's bust. But what if she asks to feed my grandmother's infant? A gesture of gratitude for the roof, clean bed linens, and secrets kept of their belief in God. On tape, my grandmother speaks of the gas stove shaking. The interviewer asks my grandmother to repeat herself. The stove where we boiled the water for coffee shook. And by this, my grandmother meant to tell of the firestorm that swallowed her city, rocked her house, drew her to her knees. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Catherine. That was really powerful. So our next reader is Mary Leuna Christensen. Mary is an enrolled member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and received her PhD from the University of Southern Mississippi. Her work can be found in Cream City Review, The Laurel Review, Southern Humanities Review, Denver Quarterly, and the Gettysburg Review, among others. She was named a 2022 Indigenous Nations Poet Fellow for the inaugural Anapo Retreat and was selected as a returning fellow for 2023. Please welcome Mary. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And I should say I have a special love for Gitlet as I um, completed my MFA from Eastern Washington. So it's like very nice to be back um, and see some familiar faces. And as always, I love uh, working with Catherine, and I'm really excited uh, to follow her up with reading. Um, so hopefully I am not like um, a disappointment after what you just heard. Um, I also want um, to greet everyone in Cherokee by saying CEO, which is hello, um, because my poems, uh, the Mona Saturday, do incorporate the language. Um, I am an adult language learner, so it's not great Cherokee, but I am trying. Um, and I'm really just fascinated by this idea of language back that has been um, talked about, especially in um, Native circles, but especially with Indigenous Nations poets. Um, and it's something I've thought about a lot, again, as an adult language learner and as someone who was raised by their grandmother who was afraid um, to really teach us her language because of the punishment she received growing up. Um, so the first poem that I'm going to share is... Uh, entitled At the Casino Hotel on the Res, and it is a read in title. At the Casino Hotel on the Res, located in the lobby, a perfectly contained fire, all black rocks and equally black marble. I'm wholly aware of myself, tourists and old blood. I belong and unbelong in this place. All that family in the cemetery on the hill above the house, the house my grandmother had built but never lived in, worn from lack of use. There's talk, I'll fix the house up, make it livable and lived in. I remind myself, hill rhymes with will. 
My grandmother was strong-willed. All we can do is what the dead would want. I dream of red clay giving up what is buried, a slide of casket and decay, all the quartz native here, the finality in erosion. I've buried so many, I'm undone and reworked. The owner of the place that sells marble and granite knew my great grandfather, knows the family cemetery and the holly bushes it's named after. Says my great grandfather delivered gifts of food when in town, specifically fresh sausages. The owner discounts two headstones, a double and a single, a parent daughter set. We, two daughters motherless, a father with no daughter. Last time I visited, I stained the interior of my partner's car with red clay, cemetery stains. The path cleared to carry mother up the hill with ease, washed away months later. I rarely made it to the gravesite, a lone paw bearer. Mother's silk flowers were stained red, grandmother's too. Here now in December, there is no snow, just a wetness, a bone deepness. Like the lobby's fire, I contain so much. Mostly it's death and the effects of it. I contain so much. My blood is percentages, quantum printed on a card in my wallet. The card's so much like a driver's license. It can be used at the bar on the casino floor. An alternative form of identification in case I'm lost. When I last talked to my grandmother, a bird flew to me confused. When my mother told me she found my grandmother's body, my knees bruised against carpet, and I don't think I ever welled before. I was my mother's final phone call. We almost filed a missing persons report before we knew she was lost, but not that kind of loss. How our bodies become statistics. My mother was once in this lobby, belonging and not belonging. And it's only a woman that looks like my mother who walks past now. So my next poem is a bit shorter and there are um, multiple languages at play um, just to explain it a bit more. My mother was Eastern Mad Cherokee, but she was also of Hispanic heritage, her father's family from Mexico and Spain. Um, so you'll hear a little Cherokee and a little Spanish. Ama Agua. We have so many words for water. By we, I mean you and I, mother. Isn't it comical to be raised in a desert where water is luxury, where water can be a knife glistening in hot sun? The Phoenix metro area houses more than 180 miles of canals. Grandmother called all canals irrigation ditches, said vegetables grown in Arizona taste like sewer water. Here, canals touch everything. Integrated into city planning, canals can identify location. Mother, you are close to home. North stars dug deep and parallel to roads. Mother, you are close to home. Ama Agua. The words flow easily despite my broken palate, an opposite of thirst. In high school, I ran the parameter of a canal twice to equal a PE mile. In hotter months, try not to inhale the stench of empty canal, fish decaying in their own mud. Mother, even deserts have unseasonable weather. It rained so much that week. Ama Agua. There's an emphasis on A, A River, Salt Verde or Colorado, a pregnancy of water, a loss or a lack of everything. Here I ignore hard and soft sounds. Here I refuse to measure hurt. Still, I'm uneasy driving by canals, only to see fishermen and their sons attempt the bond in urban desert. 
All, I think, are deformed city fish, mouths played open, wondering how they arrived in an irrigation ditch. Ama Agua, accumulated rainwater, a careening car, a mother, a breathing in of water, here, a daughter. And I'm gonna take a sip of coffee really quick. So a lot of the poems in the collection I'm working on, which is entitled Mother Lines, um, specifically because in Cherokee, the mother line is really important. It is a line that we get our clans from. So even if your father is also Cherokee, you would not inherit his clan, you would inherit your mother's. Um, so that's kind of doubly important for me um, as my mother line was also my connection to Cherokee and the language itself and the land um, that I actually only live two hours from now um, and just being in proximity to the reservation, but also on land that was historically Cherokee. Um, it's very, it's a very homey feeling. I, it's not one I can really put into words, but I do try to write about it. Um, and because of this connection to mothers, I have a, quite a few poems that are entitled mother or grandmother and are addressed to either my mother and my grandmother. And this next poem is a mother poem, and it's maybe the key poem in the series at this moment. Mother, we lost so much language and like children try to bury ourselves in its embrace, only to find absence or a stinging white hand. Mother, not everything is communicated through touch, but some things are. At the funeral home, you pulled me close, and this felt new. We sat shoulder to shoulder during grandmother's visitation, recited the rosary from memory. And I wonder if we looked more alike then, our, mu our mouse muscles moving in unison. Mother, did you open your yellow bird mouth for every round seed of language grandmother gave us? Mother, your green thumb enough to know seeds absorb, absorb moisture easily, you to know they want to grow even in the driest place. Etsy, I was, Etsy, when I was born, you were younger than I am now, meaning my body has given nothing, meaning my body only takes. I swallow this mother tongue, not to bury it in a belly, but to quench thirst. At sea, I like how pretty water felt on my tongue. I wanted to name a daughter Ama, but water can be stagnant and mildew coils the air. At sea, I was told my poems are beads strung with asterisks. The word for beads is a della distori. I stumble, drop beads from strings, try not to crack them underfoot. At sea, I only want to make you a gift. At sea, I drink so much and I'm still thirsty. And with that, I'm going to take another drink of coffee. So this last poem is a grandmother poem. And it's actually one I've been playing with a lot. Um, what I'm going to read was a section of a longer poem. Um, the sister poem to the, what I just read. But I realized that the pieces of that poem were better separate. Um, and in the last few weeks, I've been playing with this poem a lot. So this is most likely not its final form, but it, the current version, this will be the first time that I'm sharing it. So please bear with me if I stumble at all. Grandmother, I haven't cut my hair. It's still a long, undyed version. A receiving blanket tucked around the edges of my scalp. Flannel you surged and gave us gifts. You said so many times a white man would convince me to cut my hair and they have tried or tell me how lovely it is in a way that makes me want to shear my head clean. You never let me cut my hair. Your mother's long silver when rheumatoid clawed her hands. Your father, who called me only long-legged gal, braided her hair despite his own farm hands. It's not as easy as saying tradish. You, a navy photog, hair style close to neck and later thin, thin by medications. It's not as easy as saying, I share your mother's first and middle name. 
It's not as easy as saying I have a man whose last name is Scotch-Irish Common. It's not as easy. Thank you. Ski, everyone. Thanks so much, Mary. Uh, thank you both uh, for sharing your poems today. And also thank you for preparing to ask each other a couple of questions. We are gonna move into that portion of the event now and I'm excited to hear more about your process and your inspiration. So we'll just let you all just take it away. Mary, you left me wanting for a few more poems. I'm just gonna say that. I was like in the rhythm of, of your stunning collection. I can't wait for Mother Lines to find a home. Um, do you want to start with a question, Mary? Otherwise, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, I don't want to like take over the floor, but um, I do have a question. So I know your current project a little bit more than the one that you read from, and I know that you have this interest in DocuCritics, is one that we share. Um, but listening from your collection, I can't um help but see that you're documenting the domestic and the personal, do you consider that a type of docu-poetics? And then coming from that question, how do you, do you see any kind of relationship between um, Full and Blue House and your current project? Uh, really, really fascinating question, Mary. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, if, if you'd asked me um, outside of framing it that way, I, I might've said no, that uh, I'm not, I don't consider Fool in a Blue House particularly docu-poetics, but this idea of documenting the domestic is a really, uh, sounds like a great AWP panel title or something like that. It sounds like a really uh, much smarter uh, than I think I was uh, in approaching drafting these poems. Um, but I might definitely see like some, uh, I mean, there is like literally some document, right? Particularly a conversation in Home Depot's kitchen department with a line from Mrs. Dalloway. Um, you know, kind of bringing in, uh, I guess that's, that's also a phrasis or, or um, illusion, but I think there's a sense of the document uh, or docu-poetics in that poem um, as well. Uh, I feel like I had another poem I read today that seemed to intersect with that idea. Um, but I, I want to say, yes, I think documenting uh, the domestic is is quite important. And it maybe brings in some of my research interests outside of creative writing, um, which is that I see um, Dorothy Wordsworth, William Wordsworth's sister, as quite important in um, documenting the domestic and making it, um, reclaiming it as worthy of um, a poetic eye. Because um, I think a lot of poets in the Romantic era, particularly female poets, rejected the domestic as material for poetry. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think I'd have to think about the question more, because again, I love the idea of uh, documenting the domestic, but to talk about connections between the projects, maybe veering away from docu-poetics a bit, um, is I see sort of the um, relationships between um, mother and daughter um, quite relevant in, in Fool in a Blue House, and I think has certain relevances to the project that you're referencing that I'm working on right now, um, which is called Hunger Winter, tentatively, um, which is exploring kind of the inheritances of um, past traumas of the, the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands. Um, oh, where is I going to go with that? Um, so yeah, the kind of the, the maternal uh, impact. And so I guess th that's actually a good, um, or maternal relationships, a good pivot to ask you a question, Mary, which is that um, where do you see um, maternal and also, you know, grandmotherly relationships um, occupying your project? I know you mentioned, um, inheriting, you know, mother lines, inheriting clans through matrilineal um, inheritances. Um, and I even also saw wonderfully, I think today might be mother language day, um, meaning, you know, your, your inherited maternal tongue. Um, so that feels also very timely for your current project. So I'd love to hear about how mothers and grandmothers occupy your project currently. Yeah, thank you. I do well that one of the things we have in common is our like relationships with our mothers um and how we write those relationships um and I also love that your cat is just sitting there um to kind of share with the animal um aspect of today's reading my dog has been sitting here the entire time <laughs> just in my lap um but yeah so obviously like mother language with her land all that plays in um to to my project um and I was raised by my mother's side of the family so 
um, and by these women that were really strong, um, but also um, had traumas that they were working through. Um, and my relationships were at times strained because of these traumas. Um, my mother and I were rebuilding relationship at the time of her death. Um, so I think I think a lot about how the relationships worked, how they would work now, um, if either of them were, you know, still here. Um, but, and I, th and I have trouble, um, kind of separating sometimes, and I think it's one reason why I write it out, um, separating that, um, interracial trauma, um, from my existence as an indigenous person. Um, and I don't know if that's a bad or good thing. I think it's something I'm still working out myself um, and how we consider intergenerational trauma as um, like ongoing impacts of colonization and genocide. Um, and like just looking at my family, like a lot of, a lot of um, you know, our key experiences, um, you know, we wouldn't have had those if it wasn't for this colonization. Um, you know, this um, relationship with our language, um, you know, we would have had more of it, I assume. Um, you know, land, um, I write a lot about land um, and um, I have a project I've been working on that I think would entwine with my current project. So just a longer lyric essay. Um, kind of a hybrid piece because I'm really fascinated by hybrid work um, that talks about like specifically um, land and bringing back uh, artifacts and ancestors to the land that they belong to. Um, and so I find myself thinking about land, how it's been eroded, like language has been eroded. Um, and that piece specifically looks at a burial mound that um, until pretty recently, um, was farmed and you know these farmers did not have that connection to it being a burial mound and it is barely like a little hill now because of this decades of farming um and now we have made that a sacred site it is now ours again um so i do think a lot about how land has been eroded um and um, I guess another aspect I write about a lot connecting with mothers is um, they are both buried in a family cemetery um, that I mentioned in the poems. Um, and there's, you know, sometimes there's landslides because it's just a little um, cemetery on a pretty mountainy hill between two uncles' houses. And my grandma's property is straight down from it. Um, so if you to were to look out one of her windows, you would see straight up into the cemetery. Um, but yeah, if you have a good rain, like, you know, sometimes there is a landslide. Um, so there's also that kind of erosion and thinking about, you know, if that goes and there's just this, you know, slide of caskets. Um, and as morbid as I am, I sometimes joke that if I was to be buried, I want to be at the very top. So I have like the farthest to slide down. Um, but so, yeah, I just, I have trouble disconnecting mothers from pretty much everything that I do. Um, because just, you know, not Cherokee aspect, but like they raised me, like what I do and what I know is because of these women, um, and you know, our very relationships. Yeah. You, you, you hinted at one of my other questions for you, but I'll, uh, well, my, my other, another question I have for you, Mary, just to, since you already started to mention it, um, is I, I know how important land is to your poems, um, and I was wondering um, if you could talk, and particularly as well, and I don't think you've quite clarified this, and this comes with a little bit of personal knowledge about you. Um, you know, you have uh, poems that deal with the land of, um, you know, historically your people and like the reservation, um, and then also Arizona as a space you grew up. And I know that the, again, maybe personal knowledge, but the fish, rotting fish come from that Arizona landscape, as do the canals. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about um, how land manifests in your poems, um, you know, related to the reservation, but also growing up in a space that was not historically, um, you know, your your uh, Ch Cherokee people's land, but other uh, uh, largely or obviously other indigenous people's lands. But yeah, if you could kind of maybe give some insight into that and how that makes it its way into your poems. 
Yeah, um, I used to consider myself very much a place poet, especially during my my MFA years. Um, but I don't know if I still consider myself a place poet. Um, but I do like I, well, I don't know. I think when I grab myself to write, um, really environment is big for me. Um, this those details is usually my way into things. Um, that's how I connect. Um just spatially, I think, spatial awareness. But yeah, I grew up in Phoenix and I grew up with my grandmother, um, with my mother living not too far away. Um, and so yeah, a Arizona's why I know they both passed in Arizona. Um, and you know, we we transported them to to motherland to the family cemetery. Um so yeah, Arizona is like it's a place of like tension, I guess, for me. And I think that tension shows up in the poems. Um, so it's a place I grew up, I obviously I have fond memories, but it was also the place where a lot of those, for me, those um, traumas brought on by generational trauma really showed up. Um, so again, like very mixed bag. Um, and then, so um, just, I guess, clarified, I think some of it was evident in the poems I shared, but my mother um, died in a car accident um, she was hit by a drunk driver and her, her vehicle was flipped into a canal. Um, so this land in Arizona also is this kind of site for this violence as well. Um, this very personal violence. Um, so even though I didn't like the heat and I think Phoenix is really too spread out and I already had my own issues with this growing up in Phoenix and how hot it always was. Um, now it's just kind of more personal violence that I'm trying to still figure out. But yeah, and, but um, at the same time, growing up, I wasn't, um, I wasn't away from other indigenous communities. I mean, I wasn't fully in them, as you know, um, just where I grew up, and the way I grew up, um, and you know, different tribal affiliations. But I was born in the Phoenix Indian Hospital. Um, I have a couple poems that touch on that. Um, my grandmother after she moved to Arizona, um, after she was married. Um, she worked at the Phoenix Indian School there um, in the cafeterias and as a type of like RA for the girls that were there. Um, so I always, you know, I was aware of these connections. Um, a lot of the nurses at the hospital were her like past students um, from the Indian School. Um, so I was also aware of like, you know, there's native communities here. I don't really look like I belong um, for multiple reasons. Um, you know, I I was still there. Like a lot of my jewelry is um, Diné or Navajo because of that connection um, and where I purchased them from in Phoenix from the co-op at the uh, Indian hospital actually. Um, so yeah, so like Phoenix is just really like, I don't know. It was just, like I said, a point of tension. And I think I am still kind of figuring that tension out in my own writing and just in my life in general. Um, well, obviously there's historical trauma in, with the land here in Cherokee. Um, but it's also a land that I've kind of like have this connection to um, that I feel comfortable in that I miss when I'm not living there or not nearby. Um, but it's the violence I think is it's further away than the violence I feel came from Phoenix, I guess. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. No, I, I think it was fascinating. And I think you were getting at something I was um, interested to see if you saw in the relationship to land, which is the kind of personal trauma versus historical intergenerational trauma, also like climate differences. So I think you were definitely getting at um, some of the the themes that I've seen in um, in your work as you kind of work through these different landscapes for sure. I do have another question for you. Um, so I know you as an animal lover, and I love how you've mentioned that animals do come from your poems, and they come up in mind here and there as well. Um, do you think that it's just because of the domestic quality of certain animals? Um, are there specific animals that appear more and why? I'm just kind of curious about this conflation of animals in your work. Yeah, um, and I think it's different across the projects. Um, in uh, my more current project, which you're more familiar with, um, animals uh, 
are sort of a, a more of a devastation where um, some of them are, are a space like stray animals where we were living in Mississippi became the space for me to only approximately access like food insecurity that my grandparents experienced, which is obviously like a distance and a luxury that like I'm concerned about, um, you know, these stray animals, whereas they were concerned for their own nutrition and bodily health kind of thing. Um, so animals in that collection kind of become um, a site of the distance of intergenerational trauma and um, kind of a marker of the luxuries I have um, being uh, you know, a generation or so away from the source of, of my family's um, trauma. And Fool in a Blue House, um, they are much more um, of a source of solace. Um, and I think you're right. I think the domestic definitely has um, a structural role to play in, in how they um, come into the collection. Um, you know, obviously dogs and cats. Um, luckily so far I haven't had any barking messes um with my two dogs, but dogs are a big um player in Fool in a Blue House. Um, but also horses are a really big player in Fool in a Blue House. I grew up riding horses. Um, and uh the figure of the horse um comes in in a number of different ways, um, one of which being sort of a source of emboldening of the speaker of these poems, kind of a sense of wildness and rejection of um dominance, authority, taming, etc. But also, I guess it's in line with that that's that sentiment, um, but also in the form of rejecting aesthetics or or um, you know, traditionally gendered feminine aesthetics that are imposed upon um the speaker's body. Um, so there's this whole kind of weird sequence um toward the center of the collection that maps um horses' rejection of human care onto uh, different saints in history, like Saint Ebba the Younger, um, who that that's where the phrase to cut off the nose despite the face comes from, which was meant to be a defense mechanism against um, men storming the abbey um, that were coming to pillage and exert other violence, as I won't say, because I don't want to like, um, you know, create any, uh, well, yeah, I don't want to trigger anything. Um, and then also Saint Wilhelfortis, who um, alternatively was going to be married off to a pagan king and wished for God to give her a beard. Um, that way she would be undesirable for um, the pagan king. Um, and so I think horses as well serve as like a source of meditation on gender expectations. So I think different kinds of animals serve a lot of different purposes. They also, as much as I say solace, the final note I'll say on the role of animals in Full in a Blue House is they are also sort of a form of, or a source of incidental violence. Um, in the, there's this one poem called Found, where um, my Aussie mix, she's not called that in the poem, but my my Aussie mix, because I now have two dogs since um, this uh, book has uh, been written, um, but kills a rabbit um, and sort of, it becomes a domestic task to dispose of this small rabbit that she didn't really knowingly kill because it wasn't terribly violent. She was playing and didn't realize it, but then it becomes this kind of strange meditation on um, the intimacy and the kind of the, the housekeeping that comes with um, the violences of animals. Um, so I hope, I hope that answers your question. No, it definitely did. Thank you. Um, I think that's all I have for you at the second, um, unless you have something else you would like I, to say. I do. If, if we have time, I do have um, another question for you, um, which is you mentioned um, you read the poem Ama Agua, um, which is just one example of many of the poems um, in Mother Lines that uses, um, I'll say multilingualism, right? Because it's not just Cherokee. Um, but I wondered, and you also mentioned that you yourself are an, an adult language learner. Um, so I wondered if you could talk more about the process of um, incorporating um, Cherokee into your poetry um, and maybe like what you reach for because I know you didn't read this poem today and this is again maybe the consequence of like being too close to the poet you're chatting with um, but you also have that poem that talks about naming a child was it bear in Cherokee was that what the term was it's a uh, water alma no 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 there's another poem you have anyway we don't have to worry about it okay, it's I have a, I have a <laughs> No worries, Mary. Um, anyway, there's another poem I'm thinking of that you didn't read today. But anyway, I'll just leave the question there. If you could talk about your process of incorporating multilingualism into your poems. Yeah, so there's a few words that I'm really drawn to, and I think they were like the first ones um, that I learned. And it's funny that you mentioned bear because that was, I think, the first short cute word I learned growing up. It was one of the few that my grandma would share with us. It was Yona. 
um, because everyone has, I think at some point in their childhood, a dog named Bear. And to change it up, my grandma decided the dog's name would be Bear in Cherokee. So you don't know. Um, so that's a word that I have a lot of just like think love for. Um, Ama being another in water, uh, just a really pretty word. And water, um, I mean, has a lot of meaning for indigenous cultures and now kind of this other meaning for me as just not something that grew up in Arizona where there's always drought, specifically, well, Phoenix area. But now with just um, my mother's passing and stuff, like it has a, these multiple meanings for me. Um, so I think I gravitate to these words that I already knew or um, are some of my favorite. Um, oddly enough, I have not written a poem with one of my most favorite words because I don't know how to work it in. But the word for potato is really great. It's Nuna. I love it. It's such a pretty word for potato. But um, um, yeah, so I, I always want to make sure that I'm using the correct word. Um, I mean, there is Eastern and Western dialect, um, Western being like the Oklahoma area. And most of the words are the same, um, maybe pronounced slightly different, just like, you know, someone from the South would pronounce words differently from someone from like California with like a Valley Girl accent. Um, but there are a few words that are actually just extremely different. Um, an example is the word for thank you in Eastern Africa, it's ski. Um, and with the West, you, you um, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, is wado. So quite different. Um, so I want to make sure I'm using the right dialect. And usually when you try to do a Google search, you try to find anything with the Cherokee language, you're going to get Western dialect just because there's more speakers and it's a larger populace. Um, so I try to make sure I'm using the words correctly and pronouncing it correctly, especially as someone with a speech impediment to begin with. Um, and with writing itself, um, I'm very, and Katrina, you know this of me, like I'm very careful with how the poems look on page. Um, for example, I play a lot with prose, poems and things like that. Um, but I also play with how English looks. So I might use text talk. I might use abbreviations. Um, I use a lot of lowercase. Um, for example, I lowercase I's quite a bit, especially when I'm talking about my mother or grandmother, because um, I want to give the emphasis on their character in the poem than me or the um, and the speaker, which is, you know, me. Um, but I don't play with Cherokee that way. Um, I feel like it deserves more space. Um, and it deserves to be portrayed accurately. Um, while English gives me, a, like, it's my, it's what I talk, like, it's what I know the most, but it also gives me a way to um, give space for Cherokee by um, blessing the power, I guess you would call it, um, of the English language. Um, kind of a good, like, middle finger to English language, as I like to joke. Um, so, yeah, so I think I play with, um, language a lot too with how it's portrayed on the page um so yeah I um like I said I'm still learning um the language um and trying to form um more senses and things like that in Cherokee um so maybe maybe one day I'll have a poem entirely in Cherokee but I feel like that's quite far off for the record, the poem I was thinking of definitely has Yona in it. And I, I maybe I'm misremembering the use of it, but that was the one I was thinking of. But I think I think that's all in terms of our conversation. We can maybe like end it there. I think it's a really stunning place to end it. Uh, Mary, your thoughts on language are really fascinating. All right, great. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Mary. Uh, that was really awesome. I loved hearing more about your work. And it was great to see you, Mary, as an Eastern alum, having so much success. Uh, and thank you both also for making the trip out to Spokane this year. We hope that our audiences here were able to attend your writing workshop. Um, so thank you also for your pets for making an appearance. Get Lit loves that. Um, and I'd also like to thank Liz, the assistant coordinator of the festival, and all of our student interns for helping to put the festival together this year. For everyone at home, who would like to learn more about these poets, you can visit our website, getlitfestival.org. And remember that these virtual events are all free to access on our YouTube channel, along with dozens of events from previous festivals as well. If you'd like to join us next year in 2025, which will again include both in-person and virtual events, please consider sending us a submission from May 1st to September 1st at getlit.submittable.com. Thank you again for joining us, everybody.
Bye. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you.